natural rate of unemployment. So, uh, and they're calculating it up. Some are getting it as high as 7.5%. That means that should be normal unemployment, uh, not too far from the official figures now. In the manufacturing industry, uh, uh, where the likelihood that jo jobs will come back is very slight, unemployment is at about the level of the Great Depression. So these problems are there. And uh, how that's going to be combined with uh, a, global war a global warfare commitment, expanding massive global warfare commitment, that's not obvious. Yeah. I would, you mentioned a very critical example of how the media largely fails to report on things like this. And I would like to ask you that to what extent do you think the internet might change that picture for the better? But more importantly, as we just saw this great theater piece, to what extent do you think art in general and theater in particular is doing a better job in reflecting critically on these things? Well, what you just saw is a good example. Uh, how effective it is, I mean, a lot of people are putting out a lot of energy and effort into it. Uh, it hasn't been enough to turn things around. As I said, I've been through uh, 75 conscious years and there have been games. You know, things have been done, but not enough to uh, end the fact that we're in a permanent, that there are, there's a permanent state of war going on in the world. Sometimes. It's not us. Sometimes we're not directly involved. And so, for example, right now, the uh, probably the worst atrocities in the world are in Eastern Congo, and nobody talks about that. We talk about Darfur, which is bad enough, because there you can blame it on Arabs. Uh, so, okay, that's a good topic. Uh, Eastern Congo, unfortunately, you have to blame it on a Rwanda, a U.S. ally, uh, and on multinational corporations. Uh, which are hiring mal the militias that are destroying the place in order uh, so that people like us can have uh, a coltain in our cell phones and other such things. So we don't talk about those, though maybe five million people have been killed there in the last couple of years. And there are things like that happening all over, and all too often we're directly involved. So has it been enough? Well, obviously not. Uh, has it been something? Yes, it certainly has. For example, the uh, Iraq War, horrible as it was, was nothing like the Vietnam War, uh, not even close. And a large part of the reason was there's just too much internal resistance here. In the case of the Vietnam War, there was almost no internal resistance. And if you think about it, there was finally a, a strong anti-war movement, which had an effect, but those of you who are old enough to remember will remember that it was uh, 1967, 1968, that's after f about five years of war. The first several years of war, no protest. In fact, when there were protests, they, they were broken up violently with the applause of the liberal press. Uh, so that didn't happen in Iraq, and it, uh, it had some kind of an effect in keeping it, uh, keeping it down. Now, there's, it's commonly point, claimed that you know, a lot of wonderment about why there's so much less protest against Iraq as compared with Vietnam. Just think back. At the time when the Vietnam War was anything like the Iraq War, there was no protest at all to speak of. Uh, much higher protest in the case of Iraq. And it uh, it's, you know, has a kind of an effect, uh, obviously not enough of an effect, uh, but something. So yeah, it has to more has to be done, clearly. In the wake of the Free Gaza Flotilla and the attack on it, the, um, certainly the Israeli government and the neocons here have um, made the interesting twist of uh, demonizing Turkey, who I thought um, the U.S. was relying upon as an ally to help them uh, ex extricate themselves from Iraq. So have you any thoughts as to uh, where that's taking us? 
Well, first of all, just one slight correction. It's not the neocons here. Uh, the other day, I, I occasionally torture myself by listening to NPR. I was driving home. That's not the neocons. That's the other end. I was driving home, I guess it must have been Friday, and uh, was listening to the news. And, uh, you know, they're all things considered. They have two commentators, for those of you who listen, uh, David Brooks on the right and E.J. Dayon on what's called the left. And that's the spectrum. And so that was, they came up with question. one of the questions, I think it was Friday, was uh, uh, what do you think about the uh, uh, flotilla? And the two of them outdid each other, in, uh, tried to outdo each other in uh, vociferous uh, support for the Israeli action, and how it was completely moral and just, justified, maybe not carried out very well, but certainly correct. If you look through op-eds, it's the same. Uh, New York Times has had a bunch of op-eds about it. Either they come from uh, 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 spokespeople for the Israeli government, government officials even, or, or else others supportive of them. Uh, the United States is kind of off the global spectrum on this. I don't, you know, I don't read the whole world press, but from what I've seen in the world press, it's very angry about this. Even the, you know, the kind of mainstream business press, like the London Financial Times, but not here. And it's not the neocons. Unfortunately, it's across the board. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, you're quite right about the uh, going after Turkey. I mean, the thing has been reconstructed as if in accord with Israeli government propaganda that uh, the real issue is that uh, Turkish terrorists were attacking Israel. That's kind of like what I quoted uh, from the Israeli press about uh, how Iran is, is carrying out aggression against Israel in southern Lebanon. Yeah. Or, for that matter, Vietnam. Take Vietnam. It's an interesting case. In the early 60s, when it was the Liberal Democrats, you know, Kennedy administration, uh, the line was that uh, the United States is facing internal aggression in South Vietnam. That was Adlai Stevenson, the liberal hero, uh, speaking at the UN. He says, we're facing internal aggression in South Vietnam. Uh, Kennedy called it an assault from within. That's what we're facing in South Vietnam. And, and that's a very, you know, it's a very typical component of imperial ideology. We own the world. So wherever we get attacked, and for Israel the same thing, and there are smaller domains, somebody's carrying out aggression against us, even if we're invading their country. And that's happening right at this moment, not just in the case of Turkey, in a much bigger case. Uh, you all know that uh, the, ma the main policy, foreign policy problem that the Obama administration is facing, according to the you know, analysts and commentators, is Iran the threat of Iran. Well, exactly what is the threat of Iran? Uh, we have an authoritative answer to that. Uh, there was just a study that came out, it's called the Global uh, Military Balance 2010, it comes out every year by uh, the Institute of Strategic Studies, I think it's called, uh, an institute that's basically part of the US government. They come out with a, an analysis of the global military situation. So, of course, they have a section on Iran. And they discuss the threat of Iran. Uh, what's the threat of Iran? Well, it turns out it's not a military threat. Uh, they point out that uh, Iran has, uh, uh, its military expenditures are among the lowest in the region. And, you know, a minuscule fraction of U.S. expenditures. Uh, furthermore, Iranian military doctrine, they point out, uh, is designed to uh, deter invasions, so to try to hold back aggression long enough so that it can move to diplomacy. That's their military doctrine. They say if they're developing nuclear weapons, it would be as a deterrent against military attack. So, so what's the threat exactly, this huge threat that we have to face? Well, it turns out it's a political threat, the usual kind. The threat is that Iran is what's called destabilizing its neighbors. 
how is it destabilizing them? By trying to increase its influence. It's trying to increase its influence in the countries that are its neighbors. And that's aggression because we own those countries. When we invade them, that's not destabilization. That's imposing, bringing about stability. Just read the reports. We're working to bring about stability in the countries surrounding Iran, and they're destabilizing them by trying to extend their political influence. So they're a real threat. Uh, they're also, well, the other threat is supporting terror. Uh, what is terror? A terror is Hezbollah and Hamas. Well, you know, whatever you think about Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, it's pretty hard to call what they're doing terror. Hezbollah is a Lebanese organization. Uh, it's now being charged with developing, uh, obtaining weaponry to enable it to deter an Israeli invasion, U.S.-backed Israeli invasion, the kind Obama loves, as he told us on his website. That's terror. Uh, Hamas is uh, uh, trying to protect... Uh, uh, Hamas took power in Gaza in a, an election. They were freely elected. It's the only free election in the Arab world, and they happened to win it. And as soon as they w won the election, the U.S. and Israel immediately, you know, within days, stepped up and attacked on the Palestinian population to punish them for voting the wrong way in a free election. And that was the first act of terror. The next major act of terror was, uh, uh, that was January 2006, was in June 2007, uh, when they took power in, uh, in uh, uh, Gaza, uh, eliminating Fatah, you know, the Palestinian Authority forces. That's the way it's described. But if you look closely, that's not exactly what happened. What happened is that the U.S. and Israel, with the help of the Palestinian Authority, tried to carry out a military coup to overthrow the elected government. And they beat back the military coup. And that's when they took power. That's when the siege really stepped up. Uh, that's a U.S.-Israeli siege, of course. Uh, well, you know, they're not a... I mean, I don't like them, frankly. and They do a lot of brutal and ugly things. Uh, but it's pretty hard to call that Iranian terror. You know, but that's the threat of Iran, uh, supporting terror and uh, destabilization. Well, you know, if you own the world, that's natural. So in South Vietnam, we faced internal aggression, assault from within. And in the case you mentioned, uh, when uh, Israel, with U.S. support and U.S. equipment, uh, attacks a boat in international waters, killing people, a major crime, uh, it's the fault of the people on the boat. You know, they're the ones carrying out the terrorism, Turkey in this case. And it's a tricky case, as you mentioned, because Turkey is a major ally. And how they're going to finesse this is not very clear. You know? it's, it's, I mean, from Israel's point of view, apart from the criminality, it's sheer insanity. I mean, Turkey is their only regional ally, and a close ally. It's been the second closest ally after the United States uh, since about since the 1950s. And they, you know, they, uh, they use Eastern Turkey for military exercises. There's military bases there. They're a major uh, uh, military supplier to Turkey and plenty of uh, relations in the other direction too. And to alienate their one ally by an act like, by a criminal act like this is profound irrationality and one of many extremely irrational acts that they're carrying out in the last couple of years, which is pretty ominous because it's a, it's a powerful state and when it's overcome by paranoia and uh, uh, irrationality and hysteria, there could be real dangers. I, I wanted to ask a question uh, about a totally different area, which is on our, the, the environment. The environment. Because of the not only the oil that is leaking from the British Petroleum explosion, but the methane that is being released, and the methane is the worst heat-trapping gas that there is. Do you think that people are gonna to start to wake up to how fragile our planet is and that we can't sustain wars? In, in Pakistan last week, 
They had the highest temperatures they've ever had, 128 degrees, you know. So it, do you think this is going to, there'll be something good coming out of it? Last year, as you probably read, was the warmest year on record. Uh, the, what's going on in the Gulf is horrible enough, but it's worth noting a real racist element to our concern about that. I mean, it's, it's a fraction of what's happened in the Niger Delta, for example, where the huge oil spills going on all the time, uh, causing enormous damage, killing all sorts of people. But, you know, that's black Africa, so who cares? I mean, it's not as serious as the uh, uh, oil spills in uh, the Amazon by Texaco now, Chevron. Uh, so it's bad enough, but that's what we do all over the place and nobody pays any attention. This time it's us, so you know, it becomes a big issue. Yeah, it's bad. And today, uh, Obama announced uh, uh, more uh, oil drilling. Uh, it's going to renew oil drilling. Uh, so uh, the methane is no joke. You're quite right. Uh, as uh, as uh, the permafrost melts in Siberia and other places. It's going to. It's the predictions are it's going to release a huge amount of tra trapped methane, which you're correct is much more dangerous than carbon dioxide. Uh, so and a lot of other. You know, I mean, th these are kind of what are called what are called nonlinear events. You know that you can have a sudden spurt uh, after things go continue slowly in a certain direction. Uh, will anything be done about it? Well, it's, it's kind of, I mean, we're facing the question of species survival in this case. It's kind of like nuclear weapons. But unfortunately, there are institutional factors that make it very hard to do anything. I mean, it's not that there are sort of bad people in control. Uh, the people who are making the decisions are trapped by institutional structures. So. For example, there's take. I mean, the major power center in the country, unquestionably, is the corporate sector. But if you're the CEO of a corporation, uh, you don't have a lot of choices. You have to act so as to increase short-term profit, or else you're out. If you don't do that, first of all, it's re it's, it's it's required by Anglo-American <laughs> law. So if you don't do it, it's illegal. But even apart from that. If you don't do it, you're kicked out, and somebody comes in and does do it. Now, that's the nature of the system, you know, the semi-competitive system. Now, uh, major corporations uh, and, and business associations like the Chamber of Commerce and so on, American Petroleum Institute, they've been carrying out large-scale campaigns in the last couple of years to try to convince the public that global warming is a liberal hoax. Okay, and it's succeeding. By now, the proportion of the public who thinks that, who, who believes in anthropogenic global warming, you know, human contributions to global warming, is barely over a third. It's declined sharply. So the propaganda campaigns have been succeeding. Well, you know, the CEOs who are carrying out those campaigns understand as well as you do that this is no liberal hoax, uh, that it's going to destroy what they own and uh, destroy the lives for their grandchildren. They know that as human beings, but in their institutional role as CEOs, they have to dismiss this as what's called an externality in economic theory. That's something you put aside because it doesn't have to do with uh, making the best market transactions. Well, in this case, the uh, externality happens to be the fate of the species but it's still an institutional requirement. But to overcome that is no small task. That means really reconstructing institutional structures in a large-scale way. And the limited market, it's a very limited market that we have, uh, kind of compels uh, those uh, uh, highly destructive decisions. I mean, it's the same in financial markets. So uh, the, the, this is what's called systemic risk. You know, if Goldman Sachs, they make some transaction, uh, 
if they're following, playing the rule, the game by the rules, and they have to, or else you know their guys are out. Uh, they ignore, they 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 carry out a transaction in such a way that it benefits them, and if it's a risk, they you know insure themselves against that risk. But they don't consider the effect on the rest of the uh, financial system, what's called systemic risk. That's an externality. They ignore it. And it's built into the system that they must ignore it, even though it's understood that this is, you know, brings about repeated financial crises worse and worse. Uh, of course, that can be overcome by uh, government regulation from the Depression until the 1970s when deregulation started and financialization of the economy began. During that whole period, there were no financial crises because the regulatory structure of the New Deal was sufficient to constrain it, uh, plus the whole way the financial system was organized. But since the 70s, there have been repeated crises getting worse and worse. Uh, we're likely, to, we're probably building up for the next one right now. Uh, and uh, again, this externality is not accounted for. Well, in the case of systemic risk, there's at least an answer uh, the government can regulate sufficiently to overcome this uh, serious market defect. In the case of uh, uh, the environment, nobody's going to do it unless God steps in. There's no one to control the externalities, uh, the fate of the species. But that's what we're faced with. So it takes real work to try to do something about this. And how much time there is, we don't know. I mean. What we do know is the longer we, it's delayed, the worse it's going to be. Uh, how bad it'll be, you can just guess. Barack Obama promised to close Guantanamo within a year of becoming president. Um, he hasn't done so, and there doesn't seem to be any indication that he will. So I was wondering if you could address, one, whether we understand his political and legal reasons for not doing so, and whether you yourself um, see a type of solution because it seems like the claim is that there is no solution. Well, there's a solution you can close it, but uh, actually the whole Guantanamo case is kind of interesting. Uh, Guanta we what right do we have to be in Guantanamo altogether? I mean, Guantanamo was stolen from Cuba at gunpoint in 1902. The U.S. invaded Cuba to prevent it from liberating itself from Spain. In the history books here, it says we invaded to liberate them, but that's not what happened. The scholarship has wiped that out. Uh, we invaded to prevent them from liberating themselves from Spain. Uh, among other things, we, uh, at gunpoint, passed a, an amendment which required them to hand us Guantanamo, the main port in the, you know, the eastern part of the island. And Guantan there's a treaty with Cuba that they want to get out of, but we won't let them. Uh, which uh, does have conditions on the use of Guantanamo. It's supposed to be a coaling station. There's nothing in that treaty that says you can use it to uh, store uh, Haitian refugees that you don't want, as was being done for a long time. Now, there's nothing in it that says you can use it as a torture chamber. Uh, so first of all, it's stolen at gunpoint by a completely illegitimate a treaty, and it's being used in violation of that treaty. Uh, furthermore, the fact that it's a torture chamber was obvious at, at the beginning. I mean, I can't understand why anyone was surprised when the torture memos came out. I mean, why have interrogation carried out in Guantanamo instead of in a prison in New York? Well, there's only one reason. Uh, you can claim that American law doesn't apply. There's no other reason for it. So, of course, it was going to be a torture chamber, and it is. Now, uh, it's not the only one. The Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan is probably worse. Uh, and if you look at the legal record, uh, the Supreme Court did pass a decision uh, that to make a decision that uh, contra uh, overturned the Bush administration effort and claimed that and ruled that uh, prisoners in Guantanamo have habeas corpus rights. Uh, well, that. Uh, the Bush administration tried to restrict that, to say, well, it just applies to Guantanamo, not to other interrogation centers like Bagram. But the district courts, in fact, the Bush appointee in the district court, 
uh, rule that it applies everywhere. Okay, the Obama Justice Department is now trying to overturn that. Uh, they're trying to outflank Bush from the right on torture and uh, try to get the courts to decide that it doesn't apply to, say, Bagram, which means, as Glenn Greenwald pointed out, blog, that what that means is that uh, if the United States captures somebody, say, in Yemen and decides it wants to torture them, uh, they can't send them to Guantanamo to be tortured, but they can send them to Bagra. Big difference, you know. Uh, well, that's uh, Obama. You know, on the uh, uh, legal issues, it's, uh, it's not, a, not much of a record. There's a few things that are improvements over Bush, but not on the main ones. And this is an example. But there's no, there's no problem that Guantanamo it can just be closed. Why should the United States be running torture chambers? Where do the detainees go? What? Where do the detainees go if we close it? Where do the detainees go if we close Guantanamo? Either you bring them to court and try them, and if they're guilty in a fair trial, sentence them, or else you free them. I'm not, what? what? Their countries won't take them back, so where do you send them? If their countries don't take them back, uh, we should provide refuge for them. But I mean, that's what criminal trials are. I suppose you're arrested for something. You're not supposed to be tortured. You're supposed to be uh, brought to trial, and if there's a charge against you, okay, the government tries to present it, and if you're freed, you're freed. Well, that's the problem. They don't have uh, credible charges against them. If they did, they could bring them to trial. Uh, that's why Obama is in favor of military commissions, uh, which you know, don't have anything like the guarantees of fair trial. I mean, there's a claim, well, we're at war, and they're prisoners of war or something like that. But, you know, that kind of a claim you, anybody could make about anything. Are we out of time, Sarah? Is this, yes. So there are three commercials before we end. <laughs> Noam's book is outside for sale, and it's called, um, it has an optimistic title, actually. <laughs> what is the title? Tell me the title of your book. Uh, hopes, and prospects. hopes and Prospects. That sounds good. So I think everyone should buy a copy. <laughs> um, we, ha we have two more weeks of prophecy, and please tell your friends. Uh, we're not yet sold out. We would like to be very much. Um, and uh, thanks to Peace Action for creating with us this evening and this benefit. And uh, they would like to say, and I would like to say, of course, that we should all take peace action uh, in our lives and do whatever we can to uh, change things. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt.